part one of my Dynetics tour, we got an opportunity to get up close and personal with the Alpaca Lander, including an inside look at the low fidelity mock-up that Dynetics has for this thing and all of the amazing changes that they've implemented in order to make Alpaca the best contender for a lunar lander, significantly better than the Blue Origin option, at least the one that we've seen thus far, and even better than Lunar Starship. But why is this the case? Well, first of all, I also got an opportunity to see just how extensive Dynetics operations really are. The company has thousands of employees and so many commercial buildings, it seemed to me that they owned half of Huntsville. Just so much going on with this company. But in addition to that, the Alpaca is capable of landing on a 10% grade or even worse than that, something that tall vehicles like the Blue Origin Lander and especially Starship cannot do. And because it's so low slung, it can also hard dock with lunar rovers such as the Toyota Moon Cruiser that Japan is going to be deploying to the moon before the end of the decade, and also with any sort of lunar habitats that we set up in the future. Starship and Blue Origin are going to have to do an EVA in order to gain access. But these are just a couple of the advantages that Alpaca has. If you want to see more about this, check out part one of the tour. But the most important advantage, in my opinion, is the fact that Dynetics has now improved Alpaca to where they can accomplish a landing on the moon with a single launch from Earth, whereas it takes nine launches of Starship or three launches with Blue Origin to accomplish the same thing. Are they going to do this? Well, keep watching because we've got a lot of ground to cover in part two of our exclusive tour of Dynetics in Huntsville. Okay, so as you guys might have noticed by now, I've got a team of people who have met me here to show me everything. I'm astonished and very grateful for this. Can you be so kind as to introduce yourself to viewers? Sure, I'm Jeremy Boyd. I am the main engine lead for Dynamics in the So what are we looking at here? Describe some of these components as I couldn't really describe them. So, uh, but tell me what we're looking at. Sure, so uh, here at Dynetics, we believe in pairing our analysis with test data to really ground that analysis in reality. So we have multiple generations here of combustion devices, starting at small, small scale, uh, building up to larger scale, and studying some of the different mes methods of construction. So this is all additively manufactured. And then going down to the full-scale combustors that we recently tested at Marshall Space Flight Center uh, that are you know, full power, full thrust, uh, and getting us a lot of really good data that grounds that analysis. Now, combustion devices are often the most exciting part of the rocket engine, you know, the hot flame part, but there's a lot of other parts that go into making the engine work. Um, and two of those components that I have here that we've recently tested are the turbo machinery. So this is a uh, full-size, full-scale turbo pump that we tested at our facilities, both in water and in cryo. Um, and it is quite small. It's yeah. about the size of the thermos. Um, and so there's a lot of challenges that go into just making one of these and designing them, uh, but also you know, going through the testing process and getting good data on this that helps us build the final engine. Um, and then finally, I have the turbine bypass valve. There are uh, some valves that really control how the engine works, how it throttles, and it really all comes down to a very small amount of components to control the whole engine. Um, and this is the key that sets the throttle of the engine, sets the mixture ratio of the engine, and it really does a lot of the control from burn to burn and burn to burn. Um, and so what we were testing there is how well does it function? Does it throttle across the whole range? Does it have the response time that we want? Um, so we got a lot of really good data on that and the valve performed wonderfully. Uh, we're really happy with that. Now, if you are using Methalox for your, at least for your primary thrusters, right? Yes. Now, that's you know, been a very good thing to use. Everybody's you know, going after it these days. I mean, obviously, you're 
competition in SpaceX is doing about that with Starship. Um, however, Blue Origin is looking for hydrogen and oxygen for sure. the, I guess, the BB-3 that they're using for their lander. Um, that being the case, uh, you know, it's at least in, in terms of uh, ISRU, okay, there isn't a lot of carbon on the moon, at least as far as we know. So in using the uh, the methods to artificially produce methane that seem to be in short supply on the moon. Does that present any challenges that you may have to bring methane from Earth in order to make this work if you're trying to engage ISRU? Sure, so you say you have to bring methane, you don't have to bring oxygen. Um, and so when you look at it from an OF ratio perspective, you're still able to make a lot of your propellants um, on the moon. Also, this kind of architecture, of methyl ops architecture, is more accessible to something like Mars in the future. Um, one of the interesting things about engine design is people haven't really designed large engines that have to last for a really long time without anybody ever being able to touch them again. Um, so getting engines out there that work in that environment and that do repeated missions over a long span of time means that these engines are very applicable to what we're doing here on a trip to the moon, but they're also applicable later on trips to Mars or anywhere else. Um, and so methane is a really good component in general. Um, it's denser, so you end up with a more compact vehicle. It's also easier to keep it around because it's a lot warmer than hydrogen, um, and it has a lot of those benefits um, that really outweigh some of the, the higher strength products. What is your ratio of uh, methane to oxygen in your mix? It, it's roughly about a three to one. Mm -hmm. So not a lot of methane, really. And so, because Alpaca is so lightweight, and because its propulsion system, powered by Methalox, is so efficient and powerful, this lander requires only about 3.5% as much fuel as it's going to take to deploy Starship all the way to the moon, and then for it to land on the moon, return to Gateway, and then go back to Earth in order to be reused. That being the case, Alpaca now requires only a single refueling. Now they couldn't tell me which vehicle is going to be doing the refueling, but this in my opinion is what's going to be handling it. A triple core Vulcan Centaur, which ULA already has in the works and will almost certainly be ready by the time Alpaca is on its way to the moon. This will be capable of carrying about 20 tons at least all the way to lunar orbit, which should be all that Alpaca requires in order to land on the moon and then return to the lunar gateway for reuse, one refueling instead of eight. And that gives this ship a massive advantage. So, you know, obviously you're in a competitive bid right now. And so I like to talk about competitive advantages, at least for the, the ships I like. <laughs> so now you're looking at eight engines here, obviously propelling a much smaller vessel than Starship or, or indeed even Blue Origins lander. So can you tell me a little bit about the advantages that that brings with the amount of debris and regolith that's going to get blown around by engines to try to land or if you try to take off? Sure. So um, our system is currently on four engine architecture. Um, we fire all four of those engines all the way down to the surface uh, and back up. That four engine architecture gives us an engine out capability, which is really critical for human spaceflight. Um, even in the case that you lose an engine, you want to be able to make it back to Gateway safely. Um, so that's been a major focus of our design. Um, and that can be caused by anything from uh, you know normal failures that come through the course, but also regular impacts. Um, and there, haven't, there hasn't been a vehicle yet landed on the moon that that system has to take back off again, as is, right? We've always had a secondary system that comes off that's totally protected, and so we're taking a lot of conservatism in there and a lot of safety in there, and we're thinking about that problem a lot. We're doing a lot of studies on regular impacts and uh, dust mitigation and some of those other things, which you'll see here. So, yeah, and I know you're probably not inclined to talk about others, but at the same time, we're talking about lifting off whatever, with whatever this thing weighs, mm -hmm. compared to attempting to lift off with something that's 100 tons worth of stainless steel, 100 tons worth of cargo, and, you know, plus however much propellant it's carrying and that sort of thing. Would you say that the difficulties that you have to deal with in trying to protect this are going to be magnified many times with something that's a lot heavier, or are there ways to adjust for that? Um, I, I think it really depends on the system and the architecture that you're looking at. All the different architectures are, are going to look different from a plume impingement 
perspective. Um, but in terms of our architecture and how it works, you know, we really liked the low slum nature, uh, the ability to really just get down and take a look at the engines and see, yep, they look good, we're ready to go back up. Um, it's really easy and accessible, really understand what's going on with the system. Um, and, oh, first of all, the, uh, the RCS, uh, yeah. what do they run off of and, uh, and can they be used for redundancy? Like if you have a failure or some of your main propulsion, can the RCS step in? Sure, so our RCS runs on gasified versions of our main propellants. Uh, we actually gasify them uh, in the system naturally going to the RCS. We're not running off of the main tanks, they have their own system, but it pulls from that periodically as it needs it. Um, and that's really nice for reefs, right? Because we're reducing the number of propellants that you need to have on the vehicle um, and, and using that gas. Um, the thrusters are fairly powerful. They're also um, dual mode, so they have a very accurate mode for station keeping, and they have a more powerful mode if you need to make large adjustments to the vehicle. Um, and they are part of the engine mount strategy. So in the case that you lose an engine while you're going through that aboard, um, you have the RCS thrusters there to kind of help you out uh, in controlling the vehicle and stabilizing it. This is a question that never occurred to me. Let's say Lunar Gateway is getting a little out of position or something like that, and the, and they don't. So there may be something wrong with their own propulsion system, the Maxar system on there, or whatever, and uh, and they need a little bit of a boost or something like that. Is that something that Alpaca might be able to do in a pinch, or have you even thought about that? I think theoretically it could. There are certain requirements with all of the large vehicles that are visiting Gateway because of the relative size of Gateway to those vehicles of being able to control the Gateway. Um, and control the staff. And so those are requirements that we're looking at and requirements that are being levied on us. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating stuff. My pleasure. So uh, unexpectedly, I've had an opportunity to come here to Dianetics Decatur facility where we're going to be checking out what they're doing with SLS. As a lot of you know, SLS is in its early stages of development with the ICPS, the I standing for interim, but the later stage, the Block 1B, is going to have a lot more capabilities, and this is a key part of that, the universal stage adapter. And this gentleman here works on it. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Sure. Um Dan Mann, I'm the Dynetics Chief Engineer for the Universal Stage Adapter. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you joining me today. It's, it's amazing how many team members I've had talking to me. Um, so tell me about what we're looking at here and how it's going to contribute to Block 1B. Okay, this is our development test article for the USA. It will be used for, uh, first of all, as a pathfinder for manufacturing operations. And then after we complete the assembly of this unit, we'll take it on a barge over to Marshall Space Flight Center and we'll conduct uh, fatigue testing on it. This particular unit has uh, flaws that have built in to it on purpose. Okay. So that we can demonstrate that detectable flaws by our NDE methods can show us uh, that we're, if we can detect them, and still pass, it shows that we're damage tolerant. And so we have two types of flaws. We built in delaminations when we manufactured the panels. And then before we ship it, we will actually use an impactor and put impact damage of, of a known size and location. And we will then fatigue test this unit and verify that we do not propagate any cracks based on those flaws that we've intentionally put in here. So how does this, and, and once again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm assuming I understand this, which I may not, this connects the that main core stage to the exploration upper stage, is that correct? That's correct. So payloads, co-manifested payloads will go to orbit within the USA. And so inside the USA, there's a payload adapter and the payload adapter uh, is where the payload is attached and it has its own data systems and separation system to release a payload in space. It's housed within the universal stage adapter and the adapter uh, connects the exploration upper stage to the Orion vehicle. So how is this going to improve SLS's capabilities in the future? Well, this allows them to take large payloads into orbit at the same time that they take crews into space. So we'll be able to do a big payload and send astronauts at the same time. Correct. Fantastic. And we're, so we're going to go onto the floor and check this thing out up close and personal. Is that right? Yes. 
I'm looking forward to it. Let's get going. All right. So tell me about this panel here. What, what are we looking at? Right, this is a small cutout of our manufacturing demonstration panel. This is the construction of the larger USA. Each of the four panels is constructed in a very similar way to this. We have an inner mode line, which is a buildup of ply, of uh, composite plies. We have an outer mode line that's a similar buildup of composite plies, and it is bonded to a honeycomb, aluminum honeycomb core. And of course, on the exterior, we have thermal protection, so we use cork on this structure as our thermal protection. And, and it's painted over the top of the court with conductive paint. So, I mean, how is this, how, what sort of advantages does, does a structure like this have as opposed to just using stainless steel, for example, as SpaceX does for Starship? Well, this would uh, reduce the weight considerably. Right. It's, it's a honeycomb, so remember, it's basically hollow inside. Right. There's, there's just air pockets in each one of these cells within the core, and then the face sheets are, are relatively light as compared to aluminum and you have extremely strong structure based on lightweight materials. Is, the, is m most of SLS comprised of this or is it just, just this, the exploration right. effort, the, so, or the, um, the adapter? So part of the Block 1 vehicle had composite structures within it, but for the Block 1B, this is the only composite structure that's fine. This is the largest composite structure ever to apply uh, carbon fiber uh, composite structure right. to ever fly on a manned rated vehicle. Nice. That's super impressive. Let's go ahead and have a look at the, uh, the adapter up close okay. then. It's huge. All right, so I mean this thing is obviously colossal and yet it's just a small component of SLS. So I mean what are you doing now? I mean are, are you still in the midst of constructing it or testing it? Um, it's got this framework around it. What, what purpose do, do all these things serve? So this came to us from our composite panel supplier who is just across the road here and they delivered four individual panels. We take those panels into this facility and we trim them to final dimensions and then we attach what's called strongbacks. These are aluminum strongbacks and this lets us handle a panel and still have access to the edges of the panel. So we trim each panel, install it on a strongback and then lift the strongbacks and then install them on our vertical assembly tool. So after we installed on the vertical assembly tool, we align all the panels to the proper spacing from each other and this orientation and we bond the panels together with more face sheets if you will. We use doublers on the IML and the OML to bond each panel to the next panel and so this is a completely bonded structure 360 degrees and we recently end of February completed all those bonding operations. Now we're in the process of installing the aft ring and the forward ring. So the forward ring and the aft ring have to be aligned with each other and clocked to very tight tolerances and they have to be exactly parallel, exactly within tight tolerances, parallel to each other so that there's no stress mismatch as you assemble it to the next element. Wow. Um, so, I mean, a, a remark was made recently and I don't know who should, should be addressing this, the fact that alpaca could fit inside this thing, that, uh, that it could fit inside this fairing. I guess a question that I would have, and I don't know if anybody's asked this, could you take Alpaca and a crew in the same launch with the Block 1B? So the payload is, in, is housed within the USA. The crew is in the Orion spacecraft. So yes, the answer is there will be, all of the 1B missions are slated to have both crew and cargo on the same vehicle. Wow. And so this is the decisive factor. Alpaca can travel in the payload fairing of the SLS Block 1B while it's carrying Orion at the same time. That being the case, even with the first deployment of Alpaca, it only requires a single launch of a refueling tanker, probably that Vulcan Centaur triple core that I was talking about, in order to refuel it. One launch, one landing, whereas Blue Origin's gonna require at least three, and Starship, as we all know, is gonna require at least nine. 
Check it out, guys. I am inside SLS, inside the Universal Stage Adapter. I never thought I'd get an opportunity to see this. It is huge. You're going to love it, guys. Where would you like me to head to first? What do you like the look of? Um, well, I like going to the crew module. Obviously. Let's go to the crew module. So we go over there and just wave a hand through that circle okay. the, on the bottom. On the bottom. Yep, Got it. There it goes. And then you'll get a little loading screen. Oh, no. Okay, Whoa. I've already been there, so it loaded up quick. Okay, so you're staying at the crew station. This is yep. familiar from earlier. Wow. Got another suit for scale back there. Uh, and you can navigate around in here a little bit as well. Yep. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, that is interesting. Let's see. Let's have a look out the window. Yeah. So is this how you um, how you anticipate the control layout to actually be, given the, the feedback you've gotten, or is there still a lot of design work to do? There's still some work to do on that, but yeah, the, they've done a lot of hill testing. They're doing some stuff with the Rapid Prototyping Lab down at uh, JPL, or not J at JSC, uh, where they actually have crew members come by and check out uh, pseudo screens and different uh, control layouts. We obviously would look at what they've done with Orion and learning from them. Uh, but the, I think the idea is that you can be able to, to change these around again for that the whole thing for reaching uh, a wide dynamic range of crew sizes. Uh, you can imagine that 6'4 person in their suit hunched over that window is going to need different positioning than a, a, a four foot eight uh, female if, if you end up with something like that. So the controls are, one of the key ideas is the controls are adjustable. So is this all the pressurized space then? Yes, that is the entire pressurized space. So it, it I mean, it's, it's spacious in some ways. Well, especially if you consider that you know we're going to be we're dealing with three dimensions here. Yeah. So I mean, where, for example, are the are these bunks here? Are they so the, the bunks are, are the bunks are suspended cots. Uh, I've got some stuff where I can show where everything's kind of packed in here, and you see like the doors of multiple states and the four crew members, and it's just really hard to navigate in. Uh, but if you look towards the crew station, uh, look out the front windows there. So there'll be two bunks going across the aisle. We think. So gotcha. I imagine one down lower to the ground, one up, uh, like even with the top of the windows or so. And then there'll be two more interleaved with it on the right side, coming long ways. So it'll have to clear whatever's on that right side. I think all the ECLA stuff is going to end up on the right side and up over the roof. And the left side is going to be the galley and then the, the toiletry station. Um, and then a lot of stuff is going to be stuffed back in that EDA section. So you can imagine they've got the IDA suits they'll be using while they're piloting, they've got EDA suits they'll use when they go outside. They'll take up some space. You got to have all the consumables, water, all the fun stuff they're going to take outside. So the packing is going to be interesting. It's going to be very fluid. So like you'll be in a state for launch. You'll be in a state for your docking at NHRO. You'll be in a state for your landing. Uh, and you'll you'll have to be shifting things around based on what you need to do. There we go. There you go. And then right hand, you grab yep. it. Or? E either of them. Okay. And now be careful with this one because it, it's really touchy. Oh. Okay. So. Jelly. Yeah. So be careful around that. Like even if you just get too close to it, it'll it'll send you around. So I'm four miles away from the alpaca right now. Yep. And if you turn around the other way, you'll look into Shackleton Crater. So that Shackleton there. That, Shackleton. that down there, that that I, is the permanently shadowed area. Yep. That we think has water ice and has not seen the light of day for billions of years. That's the multi-billion dollar question for support of a moon base. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, we're pretty sure that it's yep. there. Given we've it. seen all signatures of it. We yeah. just haven't actually laid our grubby little hands on it yet. I'm not sure if I can go anywhere here. No, no, this one you can't navigate. It's right. ju just where you can see here. Just where I can see what's give on. you the scale and look at the, like, if you go back and look at the Apollo landings and the landscapes they picked, very intentionally, the most people like Valley of Tran Valley Tranquility, right? Yeah. Uh, Tranquil they got a Sea of Tranquility. They got a little bit more ambitious towards the last couple, but nothing like what you're seeing here. Yeah. Uh, and just the scale of it is, is impressive. So the rim to rim is like 21 kilometers. It's like four something kilometers deep. Uh, That's big. Yep. And by the way, if you want to see that entire VR experience, it's available to my Discord supporters, which you can access by joining up with me on Patreon for $3 a month. That's all in the description. But I hope you guys can see why Alpaca has such a huge advantage over its competitors, given the area that it's going to be landing in. Shackleton Crater is going to be the most dangerous lunar landing that we have ever attempted. This is extremely rugged 
rugged terrain, not too many flat places. That being the case, you want a lander that can set down on a very serious grade, more than 10%, and that's something that Starship and even the Blue Origin lander might have a tough time doing. But if NASA is going to select this lander to be the sustainable human landing system for the future, there's another big problem to consider. Now, I'm sure you've already considered these very harsh realities. Your solution on the front end at the beginning is no doubt going to be more expensive because Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are going to take a few billion dollars and throw that in incentives at their contract in order to make it way cheaper than what you've got. Number two, I'm still making that decision in NASA, and I say, yeah, but in the long run, Alpaca will be cheaper, it's safer, etc. So I'm still going to pick it, but guess what? Jeff's got all of these attorneys on retainer that are going to sue me the minute that I do that. How do you beat that? How do you beat billionaire old companies? Yeah, that's a great question, and there's no simple answer. Um, one of the main things we could do, though, is control our own cost. And we looked really hard at that worked really hard at bringing our costs down. When we looked at the solution that we had for the initial landing system, there were a lot of things tied up in getting there quickly. And it made for a lot of inefficiencies. Um, it actually drove us to choose some, some uh, partners that may not have been the most efficient partners. What we did in getting ready for and proposing to NASA this sustainable landing system is select the partners, select the approach, architecture, the design of the lander that would allow us to not only meet all the requirements, but do so in a way that is more affordable for us and can be a viable commercial business down the road. Will NASA choose it? Will we, will we be affordable enough? I don't know. But we think we have done what we can do and presented a very compelling case to NASA that they can evaluate using all the factors that go into uh, like you said, we feel like we've got a great technical solution. We know we have a fantastic team. Um, we think the price will be compelling. Well, I really appreciate the time you gave me today and this opportunity to see this amazing project that you're working on right now. Obviously, I'm biased, but at the same time, my bias comes from lots of analysis of looking at all the competitors and seeing which ship is right for this job. And in my opinion, you've got to show Thank you. So I'll tell you, this is far and away, just levels beyond what I was expecting coming from this tour. It is amazing what Dianetics is doing here in Huntsville, both in terms of De Department of Defense, in terms of commercial space, in terms of alpaca, in terms of SLS. There is so much engineering expertise here, so much high morale. Everybody I've met here has been so enthusiastic about what they're doing and also all of the amazing advantages that Alpaca brings to the stage. To me, it's a no-brainer. Really, compared to their competitors, Dynetics has the best solution for landing small numbers of people, at least, on the surface of the moon. I really hope that NASA recognizes this. My deepest appreciation and thanks to Dynetics for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I hope you all have enjoyed it. And as always, stay angry about space.